from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, today's lecture is sponsored by Science, Technology, and Business Division. I'm Tomoko Steen. I'm a research specialist at SDNB Division. Uh, today's topic is science literacy, and uh, it's a timely and a very important topic. The speaker is uh, Dr. Mark Franco. He is the director of the Scientific Responsibility, Human Rights and Law uh, program at the American Association for Advancement of Science. Uh, most people say AAAS. And uh, as shown in the flyer, you can see that he he's authored several important papers covering uh, genetics and uh, human rights and the law. So if you are, you are interested, maybe you know after the lecture, you can talk to uh, Dr. Frankel and ask more about his uh, previous work. But uh, also, interestingly, I talked to some students who were um, students at the GW many years ago, <laughs> Dr. Frankel taught. And uh, they talk about the, his lectures really still to this date. So, you know, he must give a very, you know, very uh, strong impression. So that, uh, you know, he's a very, very good speaker. Title of today's talk, we will touch upon the very, very important topics, as I said, science literacy. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a question for everyone, scientist, policymaker, and public. So I hope we can see, the, you know, how Dr. Frankel connect among <laughs> scientists, policymaker, and the public like yourselves. So be before further ado, please join me welcoming Dr. Frankel. Thank you, Dr. Steen, and thank you for your warm welcome. Although. I always get a little nervous when people applaud before I've said anything. Um, I want to just get a little better idea of my audience uh, since we are talking about science and policy here. How many in the audience, by show of hands, would see, see themselves as more in the policy realm than the science realm? Okay, and, have, and how many in the science realm more than the policy realm? Okay, and, and, and the rest are somewhere in between or, or perhaps outside both and are, are here for, for other reasons. Um, whenever I talk I, about science, I'm, I'm also uh, very much interested in including engineers. I know there's some engineers in the audience, so don't feel left out by my reference to science. Um, I'm really talking about research and scientists and engineers. Uh, the... Um, I'm, I'm going to take somewhat of a different approach to this topic. I don't know whether it will be new to, to all of you, but some of you would probably will. I'm going to be talking about science literacy for scientists and engineers who engage in the policy process. Okay? So I'm not going to be talking as much about policymakers and much about the public, although they're, they're part of my remarks. I'm really interested in... Uh, thinking about science literacy from the perspective of scientists who engage in the policy process. That's the important context to uh, understand. Okay, with that in mind, I'm going to show you a picture in a moment for about 10 seconds, and then I'm going to ask you to tell me what you saw by a show of hands. So concentrate, if you would, for a good 10 seconds. <clears throat> Okay, how many of you saw the back of a young woman's head? Okay, how many of you, s put your hands down, thank you. How many of you saw the side view of an elderly woman? Okay, how many of you saw both? Oh, very good, okay. The, the, uh, the just the mess, well, let me show you the next picture and then I'll 
clarify the reason I'm showing you these. Okay, here's the second one, 10 seconds. Okay, how many of you saw a rabbit? How many of you saw a duck? And how many of you saw both? Okay, Okay. well, uh, the, you might be able to guess the, uh, the, the point that I want to make is that a group of people for the same amount of time saw the same picture and some of you saw it differently. Some of you saw the duck, some of you saw the rabbit, et cetera, et cetera. And we tend to see things, uh, perceive things differently. Uh, and it not only happens in the visual arena, it also happens in the auditory arena. So let me go down to this. So in case you can't see this, uh, Dilbert is told by someone that your presentation was confusing and unpersuasive. His answer is, well, sometimes one person's inability to understand looks like another person's inability to explain. I didn't understand what you just said, see? <laughs> so there's an auditory part of this. We see and we hear things differently, uh, depending a lot on where we're coming from, to put it generally. When Marcus Aurelius wasn't running around uh, directing his uh, empire, he wrote something called Meditations on Stoic Philosophy. And what he said was that everything we hear is an opinion, not a fact, and everything we see is a perspective, not a truth. And what he meant was that we tend to filter things through various baggage, if you will, experience, values that we bring to a particular context, whatever it might be. And that happens a lot. It happens in doing science, as I'll point out. It also happens in the policy process. Now, the fact that we have these different perspectives doesn't necessarily mean that one is right and the other is wrong. But they do determine what we see, what we hear, and they greatly influence whatever action that we might take. So, what does this mean in terms of science and how we might interpret what we see when we do experiments, when we look at things. Let me turn to a study that was done by a British uh, political scientist, Brian Martin, The Bias of Science. And he says, maybe the third line down, scientific facts are not independent of the interpretation scheme by which they are apprehended. The status, implications, and significance of a scientific fact may change drastically when it is interpreted from a different viewpoint, or to use my term, a different perspective. And then in a wonderful uh, tutorial that's on the uh, web uh, done by um, Edgar and uh, Carpi, uh, they write, scientific interpretations are neither absolute truth nor personal opinion. They're inferences, suggestions, or hypotheses about what the data mean based on the foundation of scientific knowledge and also individual expertise. When scientists begin to interpret their data, they draw on their personal and collective knowledge. And this personal and collective knowledge when it comes to science can influence a lot of things that are important about science. For example, they can influence the types of research that you decide to explore. When a scientist chooses to enter an area of research, there's an assumption here that there are good reasons that he's doing that. He's not picking that area out of a hat with lots of other area possibilities. There are reasons that he or she is engaging in that particular type of research. It may be to find a cure for some disease. It may be to advance a certain technology. But he or she comes to the laboratory or to the field with certain predispositions already about what they want to explore can also influence the research design and statistical or analytical approaches you use in your work. If you have some experience with a certain approach and feel comfortable with it, you're more likely perhaps to use that approach again. At some point in time, that approach is not going to give you the kind of insights that you want and you may well have to change. But the point is making those kinds of decisions and making those choices 
are based on some existing predispositions that are already there. Maybe you learned a technique from a mentor, and that's the technique that you want to use. Someone else might say, well, that's not the best technique, and use another. Nevertheless, again, those choices which we think of as scientific are really, really created, if you will, because of some sort of past experience, some of which has to do directly with science, some of which may not. And then the way, ways are, way that uh, findings are reported. There's a lot of evidence that shows when scientists get to the point of reporting their work, um, it is often done in the context of an environment in which they're thinking about how their work will be received. For the most part, they're interested in how their peers will receive that information. But we do know that more and more scientists is engaged, science is entering into the policy process much more frequently than in the past and carries some weight along with it. Uh, so how things are reported has implications for how they are interpreted and viewed by others. So all of these things, and for those of you who are in science, think about science and engineering, the kinds of things that relate to those three that we often think are very objective, uh, that are independent of one's personal values or what's going on elsewhere, uh, there really is a link there. And that's a very important point that I want to try to make today. That we talk about science in a very objective way, but in every way, science is in some manner affected by other things that we would all consider to be not very objective. And I think that recognition is awfully important for scientists to make. And later on in my talk, I'm going to try to make the case that that's part of what is necessary for science literacy if you're a scientist or engineer engaged in the policy process or think that you want to be. So what's the take-home message, if you will, from sort of this part of the talk? This, um, this is a wonderful article, but I really like the title, Science Does Not Speak for Itself. And neither do data, techniques, nor findings. Someone has to give voice to the data, the techniques, and the findings. And your voice might well see things differently than somebody else's voice, even though you both have very similar backgrounds in the science, let alone somebody who might be considered a policymaker or a member of the public. So please you know, keep that in mind. The point that I'm trying to make is that things may not be as they seem to be when we think of science uh, as something that is sort of independent of other things that are going on in a person's life. So how does this play out, if you will, when scientific evidence is introduced into the policy process? So I want to talk a little bit about the relationship of evidence to policy, that is scientific evidence to policy, but I want to tell you a little bit story, tell you a little bit of a story first. Um, it's probably, um, probably some truth to it, in part urban legend. I heard it many, many years ago. But the story goes like this. There are a group of scientists who are visiting Washington, D.C. to learn a little bit more about the policy process. That's, that's fine. And the first speaker is in, during breakfast. And he's making his presentation, and during the course of his presentation, he says the following, that it's very important for all of you scientists visiting Washington that here in Washington, facts are negotiable. Well, some people in the audience are squirming a little bit in their seats. What does he mean by that? Well, then we come to lunch. There are always speakers at breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Um, and this speaker says... You have to understand that here in Washington, we treat facts differently than the most of the other parts of the country. <laughs> A little bit of that undercurrent of conversation as they look at each other. And then finally, this is in late afternoon, yet another speaker sends the message home quite forcefully by saying, here in Washington, perceptions are what matter, not the facts. As I said, probably part urban legend. Maybe there's a little bit of truth to that as well. So with that as a context, there are probably three fundamental questions that one wants to ask of science when it comes to policy. That is, 
when you are attempting to make a claim about science toward a particular policy perspective, to have your science considered, there are at least three questions that I think scientists would ask and policymakers would ask as well. The first is, what counts as scientific evidence? That is, how do you know you have the right evidence? For the get for the moment how good it is, is it the right evidence for the problem or the policy in mind? This is particularly important in the regulatory arena. One of the toughest things to get past in the regulatory arena here in the United States is deciding as what counts as scientific evidence. What are we going to consider before we issue any kind of regulations? And the fact of the matter is that many scientists will disagree over what counts as scientific evidence in a particular regulatory policy consideration. Second question. Is the existing scientific evidence sufficient in support of action? I don't know how many of you can read what's uh, on the uh, back of that truck. I can't either unless I put my glasses on. It says the scientific community uh, is, uh, um, is divided on this particular issue. Some say that the stuff here is dangerous. Some say it's not. So put another way, how strong is the science that you are considering? That's another thing that people would want to ask quite naturally. I mean, it makes a lot of sense. And then there's the third question, and that is how should the scientific evidence be weighed against other factors that we have to think about in terms of public policy? And I just mentioned a couple of the risks and benefits of implementing policy and public opinion. How do we go about weighing all of those? Well, those are clearly questions, again, which non-scientists will be very, very uh, interested in. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, the, uh, they will involve scientists in that process as well. It's important for the scientists to understand, however, that science is just one piece, if you will, of the entire policy process. OK, so that is sort of the the background, if you will, for thinking one about science and how science itself is affected by a variety of different things that are often not considered to be, quote, pure science. Uh, second, when science is entered into the policy process, we have to think about those questions of which science is only one part. Third, we have to understand that all people see the same thing or can see the same thing differently and that this is also has an effect on your ability to do science and your ability to interpret science in the context of public policy and has lots of implications for science literacy. Okay, so now we're going to move from that background, if you will, directly into the policy process. So we had, we had some questions about evidence and introducing that into the policy process. Now we're going to move to the policy process. And I think for those of you who are in Washington for any amount of time, you would probably agree that policy is messy. Uh, not one of my best, but nevertheless, messy. Um, there are all sorts of things going on in the policy process. And if there's a strong S&T component, science is one of those. But I think it's very important to understand that within this messiness, it's not easy getting your voice heard. And there are lots of things that you may have to do in order to get your voice heard. And this presents some challenges for scientists. Let me give you an example. This is from an article written by scientists who are very much interested in getting more scientists engaged in the policy process. And its focus is on neuroscientific evidence, but it could be any scientific evidence. So bear with me while I parse this out a little bit. It says the incorporation of neuroscientific evidence into policy debate should be closely monitored to ensure, that's my emphasis there, to ensure that the contribution is substantive rather than purely rhetorical, and that, again, my emphasis, that neuroscientific evidence is not used as a vehicle for espousing particular values, ideologies, or social divisions. Now, when I first read that, my reaction was, well, give me a break. I mean, where do these people live? Where do they operate? <laughs> let, me, let me go back to the word insure. A synonym for the word insure, is, of course, is guarantee. How can you possibly ask scientists or anybody else to guarantee 
that something will or will not happen. It's asking too much. And one of the worst things you could do, it seems to me, is to ask any stakeholder community to do something they can't possibly do. And that includes for scientists. So that bothered me a little bit. And then what it is, ensure is the verb, what it is that they were supposed to ensure, that the evidence is not used as a vehicle for espousing particular values, ideologies, or social divisions. Social divisions, for example, is an example of an experience that one may have. Well, what did I just talk about? I mean, that is, that is impossible in the context of reality. Values, ideologies, and social divisions are what feed into what become our perspectives and our view on different things. The notion that you can get engaged in the policy process, just as you can get engaged in doing science, that you can ensure in some way that your contribution is not used as a, et cetera, et cetera, it seems to me is short-sighted. It seems to me it also complicates things for the scientist. And again, I'm going to get back to this at the end of my remarks. It complicates things for a scientist who wants to engage in the policy process, thinking that somehow he or she is going to be able to avoid a situation in which that takes place. So I don't want to be overly harsh on these particular scientists and what they wrote, but I think I wanted to make the point that this is not the kind of message we want to send to the scientific community for those who want to be engaged in policy. As is noted here, the evidence is filtered through a set of political values, and science is viewed as only one of several ways of knowing. And knowledge is mobilized selectively in the process of continuous negotiation, to use the word that that little story I told you yesterday, negotiation. Things are constantly under negotiation. Even scientists will negotiating things when they are interpreting something. How do you decide as a research team what outliers? What are the outliers? What are the data points you won't necessarily report? You're negotiating with your colleagues at that point in time. It happens in science and it happens in the policy process. We have to remember that people are simply not blank slates. They come in with the values, the knowledge, experience, all of which interact with those other factors which are very important for leading to some sort of decision and action. For example, seek information. How you feel about an issue will determine a great deal about what kinds of information you are looking for and what information you will seek out. Assessing reality. Whose reality? You're going to assess the scientific information or any other evidence against whatever reality there is as far as you're concerned. And then finally, taking action. Again, what motivates someone to take action? Well, these, this will vary, of course. But to some extent, that motivation is based on what you bring to the discussion. Now, this next quote is a little lengthy, but bear with me because I think it's worth reading. People are often inclined to accept data and interpretations that appear to validate their prior views. They may search for any evidence that their preferred conclusion is valid and stop once confirmation is found. By contrast, people tend to view with suspicion data that contradict their preferences in, and beliefs. They give greater scrutiny to and look for reasons to reject the validity of contradictory claims. Because most real-world bodies of evidence, including science, have flaws, inconsistencies, and ambiguities, people motivated to accept or reject a claim can often find at least some grounds for doing so. Does that sound like anybody you know? Or maybe it sounds like somebody you know very well when you look in the mirror. So all of this is going on and feeds into the policy arena where the scientific evidence not only has to compete, if you will, down here with the other stakeholders and their values, ideologies, and knowledge, but has to deal with political uncertainty, limited resources, limited time, and also questions about how prime is the issue to which your science might contribute. That's another fact that is ongoing. Is this something which is going to clamor for attention or something that is on somebody's back burner? All of this is going on while you're trying to get your science done and engaged in the policy process. So that takes me to another part um, of my talk. And that is, I want to, since I am focusing a lot on scientists, 
I want to talk a little bit about how scientists behave and show you some examples uh, of behavior. And this is the kind of behavior that we might say, oh my goodness. But the fact of the matter is it happens a lot more often than we might want to admit as scientists. And it has an impact on our credibility as well as the policy process. So let me share some things with you now, again, about focusing on scientists and their behavior. Now, when you look at this cartoon, I bet 99 to 100% of you will say, aha, uh -huh, the onus of responsibility for all of this misinformation belongs to the fellow on your left, the politician, the policymakers. Well, I think in part that's correct. But I also want to suggest to you that scientists also engage in passing on misinformation. Um, and in some cases, this is unconscious, if you will, and in other cases, it's very explicit. Let me give you some examples. This is from Rick Weiss, who is now with the Office of Science and Technology Policy, but you may remember him as a reporter for the Washington Post in Science. He refers to this as the increasing shameless marketing of science. Even as reporters struggle for space to explain the latest findings, they're also having to filter out the growing amount of overhyped material washing over the transom. Here's some empirical study. This is a study in 2009 looking at various uh, medical centers, academic medical centers, and it looked at the press releases. Now, quite often at these institutions, the scientists and the press office are working together to get something out. Because why? Well, the institution wants to draw attention to the good work. Why? Because it brings prestige and funding and other good faculty, if you will. So they did a study of these uh, various uh, press releases and found, among other things, 29% of the releases were rated as exaggerating the findings' importance and that almost all of the researches included quotes from the lead investigators, and 26% of those were judged to overstate research importance. And they go through their methods, et cetera, and they have a lot of other examples. It's very depressing to read if you actually were thought otherwise, that such things really happening. And when you put together business and science, well, then it really can get carried away. Here's a quote from the chief uh, scientist and health correspondent at MSNBC and NBC, Robert Bazell. He's talking about biotechnology. It could occur in nanotech and other fields as well. He says towards the bottom there, most companies lack products. So they are constantly scrounging for money to stay in business. There's a saying in biotech that before companies have something to sell, news flow drives valuations, that is, how their product, which doesn't exist yet, will be evaluated. So headlines, even if the claims prove groundless, can push up the stock price long enough to keep the company on life support. So the purpose of these companies at the beginning, these startup companies, is to generate a lot of hype in order to get the resources they need. This is part of the system. One of the best examples that I recall since it happened in the early 2000s had to do with stem cells, an article aptly titled The Hope and the Hype. When researchers in stem cell research suddenly realized that there might be a serious cutoff or cutback of funding for embryonic stem re cell research under the Bush administration, this was in 2001, they really began an offensive to try to convince policymakers and the public that we needed this kind of funding. And one of the ways that they did this, and maybe, maybe a slightly effective way, it depends on your thinking, was basically to make exaggerated promises about what this research was going to lead to. And a lot of people got the impression that this was going to cure this disease or that disease in their lifetime. And the fact of the matter is if they made these same promises today, many years later, they would still be accused of hype because we still aren't that much closer to a lot of the kinds of things they were claiming way back when. You know, I think when you, when you think of hype as being sort of an essential part of, quote, doing business of science, not only for money, uh, clearly it certainly helps in terms of prestige, and if you're getting, uh, if, a, if a Nobel uh, laureate uh, 
If you may win a Nobel Prize, it's coming your way. You're, you want to crank out and you want your institution to crank out those press releases. But the problem is that this is misleading. It creates expectations that are not going to be fulfilled. And I think in the end, uh, it, it hurts the credibility of the scientific enterprise. Um, and uh, that, of course, is at its core what, something that we, we all want to protect. Um, so it can, it can easily lead uh, to uh, misguided policies if it's accepted as something which is, quote, the truth of the matter, if you will. The problem, as I see it is, that is noted here, is that many scientists will never look in the mirror and blame themselves, as I am doing now. What they'll do is blame somebody else. Well, it was the media that distorted it. It was the politician that distorted my work. It was some other stakeholder group that distorted my work. They're to blame why we don't have what I promised that we would have. And that basically is something that doesn't speak well of scientists. And I think as part of science literacy becomes something that we have to recognize as part of what we do, whether it's conscious or unconscious. And we could talk about that momentarily. But one of the points that I want to make is there's an absolute need for scientists and the community at large to be more accountable for the kinds of claims that they are making for the work that they do. You don't help your cause or the cause of science generally by engaging in the policy process and making claims which are really, really unrealistic, even though a general public may not understand that at the time. Okay, so that takes us to part four, if you've been keeping track. Um, what I want to do now is look a little bit, there's, there's another major issue here that's reflected in this whole issue of hype uh, that's a bit more subtle, and that is this notion of bias. Do you remember how I mentioned earlier how people are making decisions about all sorts of things that are reflective of their past experience, what they think is an important pro project to pursue, so forth and so on. Um, and bias enters into these, this kind of decision making, and it can ultimately affect the science that you do. And I want to give you a couple of historical examples, um, starting with this wonderful quote from a political theorist, John Locke, all men are liable to error, and most men are in, ma in many points by passion or interest under temptation to do it. Recognize the essence of what he's saying. It probably makes a lot of sense to most of you. And those errors are in part results from a person's unconscious adherence to certain assumptions and orientations that constitute a person's particular way of thinking about the world or his or her perspective. But there's also what we might call conscious or motivational bias. And this is driven by one's explicit preference for a particular outcome. Both come into play when engaged in science and when engaged in the policy process. Everyone, I suspect, in this room has encountered both of those kinds of biases in their own work. It happens in science. This is a wonderful book, if you haven't seen it. It's called Everyday Practice of Science. It's, a, it's done by a, um, a very good uh, cell biologist, Fred Grinnell, um, from Texas. And interesting to note that the, uh, the subtitle of this book is Where Intuition and Passion Meet Objectivity and Logic. And he sums it up rather nicely. Um, I won't read it except the last line. He says, opportunities for misinterpretation, error, and deception, self-deception abound for the same reasons that I have been discussing with you. So I want to look at two historical uh, examples. These are both very, very prominent scientists in their day. Uh, you may recognize both names. I'm sure you'll recognize the first one. Lord Kelvin, chemist, the father of the law of thermodynamics in the 19th century. Well, sometime after he did his work with thermodynamics, he decided to become engaged with what other scientists were doing at that point in time, and that is they were trying to determine the age of the Earth. How old was the Earth? 
And while other scientists were talking in the billions, he was making the claim that the Earth was, oh, maybe about 400 million years old. And he was unmoved by all of this contradictory evidence, more and more piled up. So why did he stick, if you will, to his particular estimate? This is a, a wonderful book review that appeared in the Post not too long ago. Um, it's a book called Brilliant Blunders by Mario Livio, and it has a number of examples. I drew this one. It says, Kelvin Sin was holding on to an opinion, even when confronted with massive contradictory evidence. He had been admired for his scientific prowess for so long that he couldn't give up the drug of being right. What a wonderful metaphor, if you will, for bias. He couldn't get up the drug for being right. The other example I want to point out is, uh, has to do with a statistician called R.A. Fisher. Again, very prominent uh, during his time. Uh, he, he lived his career in a way where he constantly insisted on as being as objective and uh, technically competent as possible in choosing your methods, choosing your, uh, your tests, your statistical tests that you do, uh, that you would do. Uh, but if you look at the, the title of this article, uh, um, it's um, When Geniuses Air, R.A. Fisher and the Lung Cancer Controversy. Now, at this time in history, the 20th century, we were beginning to accumulate a great deal of evidence about the connection between um, cancer and uh, smoking, lung cancer and smoking. And obviously, statistics played an important part. A lot of scientific studies were coming out. But not to Fisher. In this article, the author, having done a study of this particular point in time, says that Fisher was unwilling to seriously examine the data and to review all the evidence before him to try to reach a judicious conclusion. While he claimed to be interested in dispassionate search for truth, his arguments have a polemic tone. And then he concludes, what is startling is that someone of Fisher's intellectual caliber would allow isolated evidence which coincided with his previously held views to blind him to all else. Well, it may have been startling to the author of this particular article, but as we learn by subsequent looks at that part in history, Fisher was an avid smoker. And it seems evident on the basis of materials that he wrote uh, that uh, he was blinded, if you will, from accepting a lot of this evidence because it wasn't happening to him. Um, and this is just another example, if you will, of bias and how it can enter into the thinking of people, which leads to a more general statement here. Again, Brian Martin from the UK. People tend to selectively observe and interpret information in a way that supports their preconceived ideas. If a scientist is interested in obtaining a conclusion of a certain type, arguments will be perceived and selected according to their usefulness in promoting that conclusion. So, we have some examples more generally about how things are hyped, and then we have some more very concrete examples individually pertaining to specific scientists about how bias enters in the way that we interpret things that they do their work. There are other examples that one could probably draw from, if you will. So that takes us to part five, and now the question is how do a lot of people, you know, what do a lot of people think is wrong with the relationship with science and policy, and how would they go about, if you will, dealing with that? Well, I want to examine one of those uh, that is put forward by a number of people. And that is that scientists need to get more engaged in the policy process. Uh, here is a survey in 2009 which says that many people in the public support that, and look at the overwhelming percentage of scientists who said it was indeed appropriate for scientists to become actively involved in political debates. Didn't necessarily say that they would do it, but that at least it was appropriate, if you will, for scientists to become involved and engaged. Uh, my leader at AAAS, Alan Leshner, the CEO, uh, goes a little bit further. He says every U.S. scientist should embrace science advocacy as a meaningful part of the job. Now let's all agree just for the purpose of discussion that advocacy could mean anything from arguing for more funding for your field of research uh, to actually arguing that your particular research supports a policy 
option that's on the table. Let's just, you know, for the purpose of discussion, it's too complicated to deal with the definition of advocacy in this setting, but there are various definitions. And it seems to me that this has really been embraced a lot by the scientific community these, these days. Just take a look at some of these web pages. American Physical Society talks about policy and advocacy in terms of its members. American Psychological Association, public interest advocacy. Research policy and advocacy is the American Educational Research Association. I could have shown you dozens of society web pages where they basically are set up to do advocacy and to help their members do advocacy. And you really know when something is caught on fire when universities start to offer courses. And here, a couple of years ago, Georgetown has announced a very unique, innovative course in biomedical science and policy advocacy. So, I mean, clearly this has caught on. But what I want to do is just put up a little yellow flag, if you will, of caution. Advocacy, like policy, is very messy, and it can get you into a lot of trouble if you don't know what you're doing. Uh, and you need to be very careful about this. So while I personally happen to agree with the thought that more scientists should be engaged with the policy process, I think there are serious challenges involved in that that I want to uh, share with you. One of those challenges is what I call sort of a, a, a competency uh, issue. Uh, and that is I don't, I'm not convinced that scientists, generally speaking, there are always exceptions, are ready to engage in advocacy based on what they've done back in the lab or the field. This is a quote from Larry Goldston, who is, uh, was a chair of an American Society for Cell Biology committee. He was presenting the Society Award to Nobel laureate Paul Berg. He says, Berg has shown us that the ability to do, most, do the most important and valuable scientific research sometimes requires that we leave our labs to support, defend, and explain why what we do has value. It's fine. Then, my emphasis added, the same skills that make for great science make for great science advocacy. I'm not convinced that that's the case at all. I've never seen any evidence of it. And quite frankly, we tend to send our scientists out to do advocacy, and they tend to mess things up more than they help things. They just don't know how to go about doing it. And that, again, is going to be part of my discussion of science literacy for scientists. Um, there are also some really serious ethical issues associated with this. Does advocacy detract from the objectivity and dispassion typically expected of scientists? Expected. Now, in the real world, we know a lot of that is not the case. They're as biased as anybody else. But nevertheless, there is an expectation that for the science to be credible, uh, it has to be sort of independent, dispassionate, so forth and so on. Is there a concern that a scientist's unconscious bias may not only affect how studies are designed, but also how the results are perceived, interpreted, and reported? I hope you've heard enough here this morning to answer yes. There is a very serious concern. When do scientists cross the line from being an independent source of valued information to designing or using their research to support some preconceived policy preference? This is conscious bias or motivational bias. Again, I wish I could give you a concrete example of where that line is, but quite frankly, it's complicated. And I think unless scientists realize that, they probably should pull back a little bit before they get too engaged. And then perhaps the, the, the ultimate question that one would love to, uh, to have answered is what constitutes responsible from a point of view of ethics advocacy and what would be considered irresponsible? I don't have those questions answered either, but I want to make the point that they're very important questions that haven't received enough attention by the scientific community. And so before you jump into advocacy, think about the implications of doing that. Okay, well now we've, we, we're, we're here at the, we're almost at the finish line, so sort of hang in there with me as I bring things to closure. So how do we close that chasm, if you will, that I mentioned in the, uh, in the talk, my, my talk title, that is between uh, the science and the policy. How do we, how do we help uh, try to close that? Well, we know that the chasm is not due, at least I hope we know by now, the chasm is not due to a, short, a shortage of facts or ideas. More data are not necessarily going to close that chasm. That's not going to work. Rather, the chasm is there because 
of competing perspectives and competencies with regard to the scientific community and the policy world. So what does this mean for science literacy? Well, I thought what I would do, and this is what any self-respecting researcher will do in this day and age, I thought I would take a look at how people define science literacy. Just get a feel for how the experts think what science literacy consists of. So I did, again, what any self-respecting researcher would do. I Googled uh, science <laughs> literacy. And I came up with, this was about 10 days ago, I came up with 2,260,000 hits. And no, I did not look through all of them. I will admit that. But I looked through enough to come to this conclusion. And that is none of those definitions are meant to describe a scientist. They're all meant to describe non-scientists. There is some expectation that science literacy means something that I'm going to argue is sort of narrow, um, that a scientist has it already. That's not who we're talking about. I'm arguing differently. I'm saying we have to come up with a science literacy definition for scientists. When they're interacting in the policy process, I do want to make it clear that I'm talking about that context. So I have six components to my uh, definition of science literacy for scientists. And hopefully they will flow reasonably well from what I've said already, but uh, we'll see how you feel about them. So here we go. This is what science literacy must include for all scientists who are interested in engaging the pol in, a, in the policy process. An understanding that science and scientists do not operate in a vacuum, that there's always a context for doing science as well as the interpretation to make sense of it. Scientists need to develop a perspective on the nature of science and the role of science in personal life and society. They need to have a way of thinking of science that is sensitive to a wide range of social implications. They need to consider the political, economic, and ethical aspects of science as they relate to personal and global issues. Realizing that science is changing rapidly, not only in terms of its research techniques and organizational structures, but also in its relationship with society. Three more to go. He hopes. Oh, here we go. Scientists need to acknowledge the question that the question of what scientists are good at doing must be accompanied by the question of what are we good for. Again, when engaging the policy process, what values are we bringing to the policy process? Think about that before you engage. Not just what you can do and do well, but what's going to be used for. Scientists need to appreciate, and here's a quote from a Nature editorial in 2010, which I don't think I could have said any better. People, politicians included, make decisions on the basis of self-interest and their own hopes, fears, and values, which will not necessarily match what many researchers deem self-evident. For me, this leads to the insight that the views and behavior of non-scientists about science and its uses are not necessarily irrational from a scientist's point of view. The message there is we have to be better listeners. We have to realize that for some people, it's not necessarily the facts, but the core values that they bring to the issue. You could have told people who opposed embryonic research on religious grounds about all the possible cures that could possibly f happen in the next X number of years until you turn blue. But it wasn't going to have an effect on those people because it wasn't about, you know, we'll go out, we'll collect data, we'll have findings, and we'll have cures. It was about something else. Scientists need to recognize that when they get engaged. And then the last one, recognize the limitations of your training to operate effectively in the policy process. Acquire the skills needed to be effective and develop rules of engagement when playing in the policy sandbox. You know, as this goes back to some of the ethical issues I raised earlier. You can't, it seems to me, develop rules of engagement unless you know what the other side adheres to. So it's very important to understand what the rules of engagement are for policymakers, stakeholder groups, et cetera, when they engage in the policy process. 
knowing that should inform, not necessarily dominate, but inform, inform the rules of engagement that you establish, ethical guidelines, if you will, for how to advocate and maintain your credibility. So my argument in closing is that if these six um, recommendations, if you will, um, are adopted as a definition of science literacy, I think it will accomplish a number of things, or at least I hope it would. One, I think it will make the scientific community better listeners uh, and observers of what's going on outside their particular domain. I think that's absolutely essential. Two, I think it could go a long way to enhancing the credibility of science and the scientific community as, as uh, well as individual scientists. And three, I think it will give them the skills, the perspectives that they need in order to negotiate, if you will, when their research is uh, caught up, if you will, in the policy process. So those, that's my sort of message for today. It's uh, admittedly a little bit different than uh, the emphasis that is placed so much on what's wrong with the policymakers and what's wrong with the public. Uh, but looking a little bit introspectively at, us, at ourselves as a scientist who works for a scientific organization and basically saying we have to do better. So with that in mind, my colleague and I would be happy <laughs> to answer any, no, we, I don't know that we'll answer, but we'll entertain any questions that you have. And I guess we have a little bit of time, okay? Yes, if, are there any comments or questions? So the question, in essence, was um, uh, the role of librarians and how librarians might contribute to sort of bridging the gap between the scientific community and the policy makers. Is that fair? Um, I guess the, 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 you know, if one looks at librarians as simply involved in the transfer of information, it's never going to be enough because information uh, is never enough. Uh, so I think, you know, librarians, as any other group, if you will, will have to figure out what their role is in this particular process. It's got to go beyond just simply transforming information. That's not enough, as I think I've tried to make evident. Uh, so the, the librarians, of course, are very much engaged these days in things like open access. And I think that is part of the process. It's important. But, you know, look at all the resistance to open access. Look at the different definitions of open access. All that's still very negotiable. So we haven't solved that. We need to do more. We need to get more scientists, if you will, understand what's going on, get more engaged. And many of them already are. Believe me, I was generalizing. There are a lot of exceptions to some of the things that I was saying. So I would only go so far as to say, you know, what is the best role that librarians can play in this particular context beyond simply helping to transform transfer information from one party to the other. And I think they can do more by getting engaged in some of these policy issues, such as the open access issue. Other comments or questions? Just to summarize, I, I think the point is well made that to the extent that librarians can help um, deal with some of the filters and get to the core of credible evidence, uh, then it seems to me that, they, that that is a role that they might be able to play. But like everybody else, they'll have their own biases. There was, yes, ma'am, way in the back. So the, the, the question and comment was that a lot of these issues uh, have been tackled to some extent by the anthropologists because they have uh, been caught up, if you will, in a variety of different roles. Some would say conflicting. On the one hand, perhaps helping the U.S. military understand uh, what's going on in the local communities, but on the other hand, that might be in contradiction uh, or conflict with what's best for the indigenous communities. Is that a fair summary? Certainly. In addition to the analysis that comes from the anthropology of science itself, comparing, for example, different scientific um, views that come from different cultural groups around the world, which is also part of it. Yes, I mean, you know, I didn't even talk about sort of the international cultural differences and how those, if you will, introduce different kinds of biases, if you will, into all of this. Uh, I have, I've been aware of this for a number of years uh, with regard to the anthropologists wrestling over this. Uh, clearly, there are differences of opinion within the community, although they have spoken out and issued various kinds of ethics guidelines along the way. Um, they, uh, they get into the nitty-gritty, 
they, uh, you know, maybe more so than some of the natural and physical scientists, the social scientists really get into the nitty gritty of some of these things and are having, I mean, they're involved in, in understanding the values and biases of local communities or in this case, the military. Um, so that would be certainly a good source for people to think about looking when you are, if you're interested in this topic generally, how have the anthropologists handled it? How has any scientific society handled it? Some are more experienced with it than others. Any other comments or questions? Yes. Yes, I, I will admit. Now, please understand that I do not work for science. I work for AAAS. So don't come up to me with your manuscript. And <laughs> can you get this in for me next week? No. Um, so there is sort of a separation of church and state, if you will, between science and sort of the policy end of AAAS where I am engaged. And there's no doubt that journals looking for subscribers, advertising dollars, et cetera, when there's something that they see as prominent, they're the f you know, they work with those institutional um, information officers who help develop these press releases. They collaborate with them, if you will, and they issue ones that are independent. Hyping, dare I use the word? Uh, the discovery, giving the discovery of a lot of, a lot of, uh, a lot of press, setting up interviews. Uh, trans, you know, across country borders, they've scientists have helped. Science has helped bring scientists together with reporters uh, in order to generate press. Absolutely, you know, journals are part of the community, and they're part of the problem. And they also do a lot of very good, positive things. You know, I I don't know whether they would look at it the same way that I'm looking at it. Again, my perspective is maybe a little bit different than a lot of other people, but I think. The scientific community writ large has to accept more accountability and responsibility for what it does in these regards and how that engage, it gets involved in the policy process. And if we want to close that chasm, I think the first thing we have to do is admit that we've got some issues on our side and we've got to do something about it. Other, maybe one more question or comment? The, the question is, you know, you know, you're not going to know all the evidence. You're not going to know everything you need to know. Action is necessary. In this case, we're talking about perhaps the end of an extinction of a species. We have to save the species. We can't wait for every bit of evidence. So the scientist has to make his or her case and maybe exaggerates a few things along the way because he or she really believes in the cause. That's going to happen. What I'm simply saying in that case is, as, as you did to a certain extent, you had a number of qualifiers there. Um, and I think the scientist has to be as honest as possible in making that case because right away he has to recognize the biases in your voice. We have to make a decision, only 200 left, so forth and so on. That tells me something about where you're coming from. Now I'm supposed to interpret your science based on where you're coming from, having heard that. I think you're going to be a lot more credible if in that particular case you very clearly state what are the limits to the kind of analysis that you're pointing to. We're never going to know, or we're not going to know in the next X number of years, et cetera. But given the alternatives, I think option A or B, whatever it might be, is the best alternative, and this is why I think that's the case. One alternative is doing X, another alternative is doing nothing, and then there's something in between. Why do you think X is better than et cetera, et cetera? I think you have to be prepared to recognize that yourself, that you're all hyped up, if you will, over saving this species. It's okay. Just let it play out. Let people understand where you're coming from. And the first thing is for you to know that. Now, before we end, I just want to thank Amanda Shea. Uh, and she is a, um, a doctoral student at Virginia Tech and cancer biology, if I remember correctly, and is very much interested in learning a little bit more about science policy. So I'm glad that she is here today as long as, as well as my other two interns. I'm delighted to see all three of you here. So thank you again for your time and patience. I appreciate it. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.